Hello and welcome back Earth Scientists for another lecture, this one on the introduction of Earth's atmosphere, composition, and structure. So this is kind of a hefty uh, topic to get through, so I've got quite a bit of information to come across, so you know, if it becomes too heavy or too dense, uh, go ahead and pause and then come back to it, okay? So what I'd like to do is to introduce really our atmosphere and how it operates, how it works, and the structure. Uh, then there'll be another video later that kind of discusses more about um, how it operates, uh, especially when we get into weather cells and systems, but this is really just kind of understanding the big picture, the, the big broad picture. So again, introduction uh, to the Earth's atmosphere, composition, and structure. So let's start with this. Well, what are weather and climate? They're actually two different things. Although they maintain the same variables, they're viewed differently, mostly based on time. So weather is the current day-to-day -day state of the atmosphere. It's hot, it's cold, it's wet, it's dry, it's calm, it's stormy. What is happening today? Okay. Now, climate is different. Climate is the term for what we consider the average atmospheric conditions over long periods of time. So I like to think of generalizations. Okay. So as an example, you know, we could say that today was hot. But I could say that generally the climate of Las Vegas in July is also hot, right? So you're kind of generalizing. So when we talk about, especially in the science community, about climate change, we're not saying that today was different than yesterday. We're saying that there's actually a measurable difference between today and the patterns that we're experiencing in today's weather compared to what happened 30 plus years ago. So it's usually a 30-year window that we use to categorize climate. So you know, think about your lifespan. You've lived in maybe Santa Clarita your whole life. So based on those general feelings and notions, and every year you went trick-or-treating, you could generalize what October 31st is like generally. Does it mean that it can be different? Can you have a different weather than what is generalized? Absolutely. You've probably all have been to Vegas when it's really hot and it rains out of nowhere, right? So it's not uncommon that you break that climate mold, but climate is a generalization. So how do we visualize that? Oh, I, th I thought this was kind of a funny diagram. That's why I shared it. Um, how do we do that? Well, we look at climographs. Climographs are really, really important to climatologists and meteorologists when we start looking at regions and locations and long-term data. So what if you wanted to generalize the weather for a particular region? So let's say Los Angeles, because I found a climate graph here for Los Angeles. So what this does is this takes in historical data, 30 plus years, uh, as well as what we're experiencing on a trend. So there's, this is a very complicated diagram. I totally get it. But as this prompt says, you know, if you want to visit Los Angeles, you've never been and you want to go in August, but you don't know what to expect. Maybe it's January. Well, looking at a climograph, we could say, okay, well, this column here represents August, right? So we can see there's all kinds of information on this. The green boxes represent precipitation. So I can say, well, generally August seems pretty dry. Uh, we can see the maximum precipitation. So the, uh, sorry, uh, maximum temperature in red, excuse me, uh, as we can see it's up in the high 70s. Um, we can see the relative humidity which is this gray brown, so on and so forth. We see the maximum minimum than the average. So the average is this hot pink color that I'm pointing at right here. So we can see that the average in Los Angeles is 70.5. That's the average. Now you might be thinking, well that seems kind of weird. It seems like it gets really hot in August. Well it does, but this is taking the average of the high, the low, the day, and the nighttime. So it's taking the, all those averages. So it's a lot of data because think about it. Sure, maybe in, maybe in Los Angeles in August, it's going to be over 110 degrees during the day, but maybe it, you know, it cools off to the upper 60s. Well, it's going to take the average of those two temperatures. So anyway, there's lots of information on here. As we can see, we've also got average wind speed, uh, meaning like what is the average gusts of wind? So we can see that we're looking at, this is done uh, in, uh, what is this? Knots, uh, two knots. Not it's pretty, <laughs> pretty calm uh, at three, as we can see in August. So anyway, uh, this one also has average sea temperature. So you can see that uh, this is this uh, hot lime green uh, is the sea temperature. So we can see oh, is there a correlation with 
um, average temperature also with sea temperature and we can see that there is a correlation with that. Can we see that there's a correlation with temperature and amounts of precipitation? Yes we can. We can see that when it's warmer we seem to have less precipitation. When it's cooler it rains more. So simplified. So this is a way that we look at weather and climate. Now some of the elements of weather, uh, you know, because weather is not just weather. Uh, weather is a bigger broad term. I consider it like a part to whole that we have the term you know, weather is like this umbrella term and there's all kinds of contributors underneath it. So with things that we look at when understanding weather, we look at clouds, humidity, air pressure, air temperature, wind direction and velocity, also the amount and the type of precipitation. So I put this little photo on here. This is what's considered, uh, it's a German Bambi. Um, it's a barometric pressure and thermometer. Uh, if you've known someone who's traveled to Germany or if they've Old people seem to have them. In fact, if I tilt my head, I've got one on the wall behind me as well, <laughs> right up there. Um, but uh, what ends up happening is based on pressure differences. Uh, the little man comes out when it's more likely to rain. The little girl comes out when it's more likely to be sunny. And then you have a thermometer smack dab right in the middle. So these are the different things that we look at when understanding weather. So yeah, we can say that today was hot. That is all. That is very true. That's looking at the temperature of the air. But we can also say, well, this is the type of pressure we were experiencing. This is the type of humidity. This is the type of, of cloud coverage that we had. So, that, you know, when you watch the news and they're saying, you know, welcome to beautiful downtown Los Angeles. The highs today will be in the upper 90s, lows in the low 50s. We're expecting scattered showers in the high mountain ranges, stuff like that. When they start rambling all that information, they're going through this whole list because this is really that idea of part to whole. Well, where does weather occur? Well, it occurs in our atmosphere. So let's talk very briefly about the composition of our atmosphere. Now, Earth's atmosphere is a mixture of gases. So yes, we say, mm, you know, a nice big, you know, breath of air, of oxygen, right? Well, the reality is the air that we breathe in, air as a whole within our atmosphere, is actually a mixture of gases. As you can see from this very large pie graph here, a majority of the air that you breathe in is nitrogen. 78% of that breath you took is nitrogen. 21% is actually oxygen. So we can see that two gases make up about 99% of all of the volume of clean, dry air. We use the phrase clean, dry air, meaning clean, has no particulate matter that was, you know, maybe um, soot or ash or uh, any particulate uh, matter of microns 10 smaller. Uh, we also say that there's, it's dry because moisture is a different variable in air and we'll talk about moisture in a little bit. So 99% of what you breathe in our atmosphere is either nitrogen or oxygen. It's a mixture of those two. Then, then the next one would be argon and then everything else is trace elements, really, really small. So as we can see here, um, I've also identify that we can observe these as either permanent or variable gases. So permanent gases, these I've outlined in the green box, uh, those are permanent gases. That means that that's the amount that we have. It's a set amount on our planet that we deal with. So things come and go, but it always averages out to the same amount. Now the ones below are variable gases. So as you can see, uh, some of the variable gases are carbon dioxide, neon, helium, methane, krypton, hydrogen. Well, what does variable mean? Well, it means that it variates. It can go up and it can go down. Um, you know, think about carbon dioxide. What can make you know carbon dioxide amounts increase? Well, uh, forest fires or volcanoes or uh, combustion of vehicles, right? Or what can bring it down? Well, by not having those things, right? So you know, when this is being filmed, uh, we're dealing with a COVID-19 pandemic. Well, what are we noticing about air quality? Well, air quality is beginning a lot better because we're not driving, we're not uh, using you know additional fossil fuels for factories and things. A lot of the non-essential businesses have been closed, so they're noticing around the world that these variable gases are becoming decreased in the volume in which they are represented. Well, what does that do? That's a bigger picture. That's a whole climate discussion because the things that are happening today will make an effect that we'll see later on uh, down the line. Now, water vapor is special. Uh, it, it's varied from 0 to 4 percent. It just kind of depends on the atmospheric condition at that time. It depends really on the day uh, and maybe even the season. So why? Why do you think it makes a difference? Well, do we think that warm air versus cold air, which one would can hold more water? You know, these are things that we'll talk about, but just think about it. It's like, well, 
how can it variate based on season? How can it variate based on the time of day versus daytime versus nighttime? Let me see, is there anything else you wanted to point out? Well, since we're looking at these variable gases, another one that I always think is very interesting, uh, methane, because most of these, as you acknowledge, are probably greenhouse gases, which are important to have, because without greenhouse gases, our planet would freeze. We need some, some. <laughs> we don't want to overdo it. Um, often, methane uh, volumes have always been blamed on cows. It's been blamed on all kinds of different situations, humans, stuff like that. Uh, so some studies came out, they found that actually rice produces a lot of methane when the seed, uh, when it's harvested, pops open and releases natural gas. Uh, but another thing that they're finding more and more prominent in where methane comes from in our atmosphere uh, as a variable gas is actually from agriculture, from using chemicals on the soils. And the soil, as it breaks down, because of these chemicals, releases natural gas as a byproduct. So kind of interesting, if you seem to think so, right? Well, we've, mess we've uh, mentioned moisture in the atmosphere. So just hear me out on this. How do we view moisture? So I threw this together. I try to, normally when we talk about absolute and relative humidity or the moisture that's in air, uh, we use beakers and glasses and fine measurements, and I rem I'm starting to think that you, as students, uh, just you don't have those hanging around your house, uh, but you have probably one of these, a Starbucks cup. So we'll use this as an example. So there are two types of humidity. Relative is the one that you're most familiar with. When I think of the word relative, I think of the word ratio. It's a percentage. So, you know, as an example, you know, this glass is half full. Well, that's a percentage. Now, absolute is an absolute measurement, saying there's absolutely this much, you know, maybe by ounces, and maybe it's by um, grams per kilogram, whatever the measurement might be. So when we say that there's absolute humidity, we'll say in this parcel of air, so maybe the, my office here represents a parcel of air, there is exactly 15 grams per kilogram so 15 grams of water for every kilogram of air in this space. It, it's, an, it's an exact, absolute measurement. Well, how can we view that? Because it's hard to see water in your in my office space, right? Well, maybe you've had a drink, you've had ice in it, and then all of a sudden the ice started to sweat. Well, that's the process of condensation. Because the contents are colder in the cup versus the outside, it's actually bringing the moisture in the surrounding air to the glass and condensing on the outside and then making the water droplets. Well, does that happen everywhere? No, because as we've already learned, we haven't discussed it a lot of it, but we understand that the amount of moisture in the air ranges from 0 to 4%. So we'll talk about that now. So what I've done is these are the uh, three most common cup sizes. You've got, of course, I always thought this was called a tall, but apparently it's a short. There's a tall and then a grande. So the short, uh, the maximum capacity is eight ounces of whatever it is. So I'm using the example of tea. I don't drink coffee. It gives me heartburn. So I want to say that in the short, there's eight ounces. So my nose itches. It's one of those because the um, seasons are changing. Uh, the short has a maximum capacity of eight ounces. That's absolute. The tall has a maximum capacity of 12. And then the grande has a maximum capacity of 16 ounces of tea. Those are absolute numbers. Okay. Well, now, if the actual contents, so maybe I measure it and go, well, this cup is full. It has 8 ounces in the 8-ounce cup. Then therefore, see, I'm using these colors, reds and grays. 8 divided by 8 is a percentage. It's 100%. This is 100% full. So I could say that, yeah, the absolute number is 8, but the actual relative humidity, the number that you hear on the news, you know, today is a high of 95, and, a, and relative humidity is somewhere around 52%. Well, that's what that means, is that in this case, your cup is completely full. Well, let's say that you upgrade, and you get a tall, which could hold 12 ounces, and you pour your 8-ounce cup inside. Well, now there's only 8 ounces of actual tea in a cup that could hold 12 ounces. So it's 67% full, right? Or maybe here, we put six ounces in a 12 ounce cup. Well, it's only half full, 50%. Or same thing, I have the, tall, the grande, uh, which is 16 ounces. You put eight ounces in, it's 50% full. Okay, so I'm hoping that makes sense. Just the idea of how we're looking at 
what the cup can hold and actually how much is in the cup. Now, I picked these two here in particular in the end because if you notice, they're both 50% full. This is 50% full and that is 50% full. I hope that you acknowledge that this 50% is different than this 50%, right? So someone who has this cup and says, oh, my cup is half full, they only have six ounces. If this person goes, oh my gosh, me too, I only have a half full cup. Yeah, but you have an extra two ounces. Okay, well, why is that important? Well, because yes, I'm using Starbucks cups, but these cups actually are trying to represent temperatures of air. The colder the air, the colder the cup. The warmer the air, the warmer the cup. So maybe you've traveled some, to some place uh, within the tropics. Maybe you've been or in farther north. Maybe you've been to uh, Florida. Great example. During August or September. So when they say, wow, you know, the humidity today is 100%. And we're looking here and they're all everyone's sweating and they're all miserable. And we're here and thinking, well, it's 100% humidity here in Los Angeles and it's not that bad, right? Well, because chances are their temperature, their cup is much fuller and much larger because it's warmer air. So this 100% cup is very different than this 100% cup. So think about that for a moment. Well, what does this mean? Well, first, is that we know that the warmer the air, the more water can be held within that parcel of air. Okay, so the warmer the air, the larger the cup, the more water, or in this case, tea, can be put in that cup. Well, let's take this into an example. So hopefully everything so far makes sense. Uh, let's say that throughout the course of the day, your grande cup here, fills up 16 ounces so it's nice and full and then all of a sudden the sun sets and it gets cold maybe it gets cold comparable to you know maybe the uh, short cup so maybe this is a hundred degrees and we'll say this represents 50 degrees so the sun sets and it gets cold really quick you've had those days well you have a cup if I have this full I need to pour all that water into this cup can you pour 16 ounces into an 8 ounce cup Yes, you can, but only eight ounces. What happens to the other eight ounces? It fills over and it spills all over the place and you make a mess. So ideally, you would create clouds and probably precipitation. So that's what happens. When you have a temperature change, you have a cloud that's maybe in a warmer uh, parcel of air merge into a colder parcel, it's going to shrink down, will condense, and will probably produce some form of precipitation. So real quick again. Absolute versus relative. Absolute is the maximum capacity. Relative is the maximum divided by essentially what is actually in there. Okay? So, absolute. There's absolutely this much. Okay? All right. So, uh, that's the next thing. Next, we'll move into pressure. Well, we also deal with atmospheric pressure. So air pressure is the force exerted on the earth by the weight of the air molecules. So what does that mean? Well, we have about enough atmosphere pushing down on us that it's equal to the weight of an elephant on your back. Now, it's not really on your back. It's going to be covering everything, the walls, yourself, your body in all directions. That's why we don't really feel it. But maybe you have experienced a difference in pressure. Maybe if you were down low by the beach and you went straight up to the mountains, did you have a harder time breathing? Did you experience something different? So what ends up happening is because of this, when the air is compressed, it becomes what we identify as high pressure. So this H here represents high pressure. This is a zone of high pressure. This L represents a zone of low pressure. So we have these imbalances on our, on our planet. Our planet is in constant equilibrium. It wants to be equal. So we have this constant turmoil of high versus low and things trying to balance themselves out. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about pressure, but there's a great TED-Ed video shared in the canvas shell that also explains pressure. So let's look at some different examples of pressure. So this is a classic diagram showing here on the surface and way up, you know, this case, 36 kilometers over 23 miles up into straight up into, into the atmosphere. 
This red line, this line right here, represents the pressure. We notice that the lower the elevation, this line is pushed towards the right. Well, this means that the lower the elevation, this means the higher the pressure. So this is 1,000 millibars. And the more we move this way, as we go with, with altitude, we see that then the number is decreasing. So the higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. So let's look at this. Uh, here is a classic diagram showing the uh, water bottle. As you notice, there's no water in it. So what happens? So this cup represents down here. This cup, you know, this bottle represents up here. Well, if you've ever traveled up to Big Bear or Mammoth or somewhere in altitude, and you've been, you had a bunch of food that you picked up at the store and you're driving up the mountain, you might hear where all the bags start popping open. Well, because you're changing altitude, maybe your ears do it too, because the pressure is changing in the air around you versus what's inside your head. Well, that's what happens in this case. So the higher you drive up, the lower the pressure, the less atmosphere that is above you pushing down. So look here. If you had this water bottle up at the top of the mountain and you drove all the way down this mountain, the water bottle would become crunched and compressed. So obviously this is empty, right? You know, so what is happening to that air within that bottle? Well, as we've discussed, we can find that temperature makes a difference in air, right? So the warmer it is, it expands and spreads out. The cooler it is, it condenses and shrinks down. But pressure has the same ability because these molecules are suspended, they're floating around. So you're able to compress these gases and squish them down. So what ends up happening is when you are experiencing high pressure, all those molecules are being squished and compressed. When you go high up in the mountain, those molecules can spread out. Okay. So obviously this is empty. Would it do the same thing if it was filled with water or maybe a soda? Well, water does not have the ability to be compressed, right? Because if that was the case, our bodies would experience that. When you go up to... Um, you know, a high mountain, you don't get, uh, you know, extra fluffy. And then when you drive down to the bottom of the mountain, you don't become thin. It doesn't work like that, right? So it's because we're mostly made out of water and other things, of course, uh, that we're not able to be compressed like that. Now, you might be thinking, well, what happens when they're in the ocean? Because in the ocean, if you go really down deep, and it's extremely low pressure, and you come back up, people can get the bends and they can die. Well, that's because you have oxygen in your blood. That's when that occurs, because oxygen is a gas, and that can be compressed and expanded. Um, the question with soda, it's kind of a trick question. Some sodas actually have gases within them, right? Carbonation. And so those gases can expand. So that's why it is possible for you to be driving, and uh, you're can of cherry, whatever it is, it's going to, you know, might pop in the back seat. So this is kind of giving an example of pressure. So perhaps you've experienced it. So what does that look like? Well, we have high and low pressure that just, ex that we experience everywhere. Then on this previous map, which I'll click back to, we have these zones, right? So we have pressure that is being regulated based on altitude, but we also have these additional systems of pressure. Well, what do they look like? Well, the first one is called a low pressure system. A low pressure area, otherwise known as a cyclone, is a region where the atmospheric pressure is lower than the surrounding area. So this is usually associated with cool and unstable environments, usually some form of weather or extreme weather. So what ends up happening in this case is you can see first, this diagram on the left represents the way that air moves in the northern hemisphere. So it's moving counterclockwise on the surface and it's spinning like a corkscrew, merging in the middle and popping back up. So we find that the central part of that has lower pressure than the surrounding air because the air is being forced up. So I mentioned that this is for the northern hemisphere because if this system was in the southern hemisphere, it would actually be spinning clockwise and doing the exact same thing, but we find that things change direction based on the hemisphere. So low pressure systems, these you know movements of air are spinning counterclockwise. They converge in the middle and push upward. So that is a cyclone. 
The next one is a high pressure system. This is an anticyclone. So this is where the region of the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth is greater than the surrounding area. So this is often associated with windy environments. So the way that I explain this in my classes is I'll have like a bunch of paper sitting on the table and I'll grab a big book and I'll drop it on the desk. Well, when that book hits the desk, what happens to the papers? The papers fly all over the place. Well, why? Well, because as that book hits the surface, it's pushing the air that was between the top, you know, the bottom of the book and the top of the table. When it compacts, it forces that air away and it blows it outward, which is exactly what's happening here. We have a system of high pressure. It pushes down and blows things clockwise outward. This is, again, in the northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere, it'll blow, you know, obviously pushes down, blows outwards, but it'll be counterclockwise. But in the northern hemisphere, this spins clockwise. Okay, so again, specifically dealing only with northern hemisphere, cyclones are counterclockwise, anticyclones are clockwise. Okay. Whew, how are you doing? Okay. So we've just got a couple more slides I want to get through, um, and then we'll move on for, for this one. So. So we talked about some of the attributes that make up our weather system. So let's talk about our atmosphere now. We've kind of talked about some of these different things in which occur in our weather, but what about our atmospheres themselves? So we have four layers of our atmosphere that we're going to talk about first. Um, there are other different layers that are put in. I know that, but we're trying to simplify this bigger topic. So the first one we'll talk about is the troposphere. It goes from the Earth's crust to about seven miles up. Um, before I move forward, just to kind of put it in perspective, the atmosphere is really, really thin. And it is so important to our existence, because if we did not have an atmosphere, we would not be living. Um, to put it in perspective, uh, you know those big classroom globes, the big ones, not the little ones, the 12-inch ones, the bigger ones. Um, it would be about the thickness uh, of a really, very, of a very, very hard of seeing contact lens, you know, maybe, you know, about that thick would be the thickness of our atmosphere on a globe of that scale. So it is a really, really, really thin layer of gases that is so important to our existence. So the first layer, we're going to work down from the bottom and work our way up, is the troposphere. So I've highlighted here in my green box. So it is the lowest layer. Temperatures decreased with increased altitude. Well, why does this occur? Well, we know first that the sun shines, the sun, and there's all kinds of radiation given off. Uh, you can look it up. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? All these different types of radiation. The one that I want to talk about right now is first shortwave visible light. That's the sun. The sun's coming down, shining down. You put your hand up to touch the, the light itself, right? The light is not hot. The sun, right? It's the fact that your skin is absorbing that shortwave radiation and then giving off longwave radiation. That is the heat. That is sensible heat. Think about when you're driving. You're driving on the road and it's a nice black top freeway and the sun is shining and you can see those waves coming off of the road. Well, it's because the sunlight is hitting the freeway. The freeway is absorbing that radiation and giving off heat. Well, our surface does the same thing. So as you can see in this diagram here, the sunlight shines down, the earth absorbs some of that energy, about 50% of the solar energy is actually absorbed at the surface. And then it is given off as long wave radiation, which is sensible heat. Now, because heat rises, it creates a convection cell, as you can see, I've kind of explained that there. But maybe you've had a lava lamp at some point, and right next to that, that light bulb is the heat source. As that wax gets warm, it expands, it rises to the top, and then as it gets farther away from that heat source, it begins to cool down. Well, that's what happens here. So yes, heat does rise, right? But to a certain extent, if it doesn't have additional heat sources, it'll start to cool, it condenses, contracts, and sinks. So that's what's happening within our troposphere, which is pretty much where all weather takes place anyway. Um, so again, the layer is heated indirectly by the sun, the heat originates at the surface, loses energy as the air rises, vertical temperature variation causes convection, sinks back down. We'll talk more about these cells that occur uh, later on, but this is the troposphere. The next layer, is, as we'll see, is called the stratosphere. So this is between 7 and 31 miles. Uh, as you notice in this diagram, this red line, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this before, the red line represents temperature change. So we can see that it gets colder warmer, 
really cold and then really hot. So in the stratosphere, you see it starts to warm up. Well, why? Well, because we can see that there's an ozone maximum. So ozone is a triple bond oxygen molecule that's very, very hard to make, uh, but very, very, very easy to dissolve. Uh, ozone is efficient in absorbing radiation, and so therefore, since it's absorbing radiation first, like a sunblock, it's actually going to get hotter. So that's why the stratosphere starts to warm up a little bit, because it has that ozone layer that's absorbing blocking a lot of that other radiation that would otherwise be given to us, which is quite harmful, and it stores it and transfers it into sensible heat. So as you can see, that's why it gets warmer throughout the stratosphere. So my question is, what about the ozone layer, your mom's hairspray, you know, the Aquanet was always the big joke. Well, aerosols break down ozone. Uh, it takes just moments to break it apart. It takes between 10 and 15 years for ozone to replace itself. So it's a very long process. So anyway, what ends up happening is we ban CFCs, we ban aerosols, and then we started realizing that the ozone layer began to close up. Well, why was it important that we needed to close it up to begin with? Well, you've all been somewhere in the sun, and you've all put sunblock on your body, which would essentially be like your ozone layer, right? And there's always one spot you missed. And that's the spot that gets burnt the most, right? Because it's not, it's not able to resist that radiation. In fact, you absorb it because it's exposed. Well, when you have an ozone layer, a hole within it allows all that bad radiation that otherwise would have been given back out or absorbed and stayed there is now able to enter through and go into our local troposphere and our Earth surface and you as a surface. So... That's why the ozone layer hole was such a big situation and big deal because it was letting in tremendous amounts of bad radiation and excess radiation that would otherwise be very harmful. All right, moving on, the mesosphere. So the mesosphere is between 31 and 53 miles. Since gases are really scarce, because remember, the higher you go up, the lower the pressure, so those molecules can spread farther apart. Uh, very little radiation is absorbed, so therefore it just gets colder. Uh, mesosphere is kind of it's kind of the boring layer in that sense, because it doesn't do a whole lot, because it's so thin, the air is so thin up there, the oxygen itself. But what makes it cool is the fact that this is the area that burns up most of our meteors and asteroids. So fun fact. About 40 tons of meteors fall towards the Earth each day, and we hardly see any of it because of the mesosphere. So make sure you thank the mesosphere today at some point, because even though it is a very thin and spaced out <laughs> type of layer that's, you know, again, 31 to 53 miles away from us, it's really important in the sense that it really burns up all of that additional material that could then impact our planet. Again, if we didn't have an atmosphere, that 40 tons of material would come towards the Earth and impact it. So that's the mesosphere. And then the next one we'll talk about is the thermosphere. Well, the thermosphere, thermo meaning heat, right, is between 53 and 310 miles, we think. There's really no well-defined upper limit, uh, and, in, and because of that, it's really, really, really thin. <laughs> the molecules are so far spread apart that it's almost incredibly challenging to measure them. Uh, as you can see, I wrote, and contains only a fractal of the atmospheric mass. Temperatures increase just to the fact that it's the closest to the sun. Uh, so it's getting additional shortwave and solar X-ray energy from that electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum from the sun. So it's going to get the hottest. In fact, it's off the record hot. It just keeps going, going, going. In fact, temperatures are more than 1,088 degrees Fahrenheit, yet it would essentially be cold to your touch. I know. Mind blown. How does that work? Well, the example I always give my students is um, imagine that we have a big bucket, and this big five-gallon bucket is filled with, uh, what are those, uh, glow sticks, <laughs> sorry, and you fill that bucket with glow sticks. They're all condensed, all together. That would represent high pressure. That would be a beacon of light, right? So that would be somewhere down here in the troposphere. Your five-gallon bucket filled with all of these glow sticks. It's a beacon of light. Well, if I want to, if each one of those glow sticks was mixed within air, 
molecules being you, and I wanted to represent the thermosphere, I would just say, hey, now everyone take your glow stick home, even though it's a beacon of light in my bucket. Take yours home and we'll see how bright it is as a collective group. So everyone goes wherever they live, San Fernando, Palmdale, Lancaster, wherever you go, and people will be like, why do you have a random glow stick, right? Well, it's because those heat molecules are so far apart from one another that it actually doesn't seem visually and sensibly that it's that impactful. But if you took all those glow sticks now spread all over the area and brought them back into one place because of pressure, it would be incredibly hot or incredibly bright. I hope that makes sense. So those are the four layers of our atmosphere. You have tropo, strato, meso, and then thermo. Now, this one here, looking at the troposphere, going back, uh, as you can see, the layers heated indirectly by the sun, da, 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 uh, loses energy, air rises, vertical temperature variation is caused. Well, what happens? The decrease in temperatures as we go up is called a lapse rate. That's what I want to talk about. Uh, what is the lapse rate? Well, the lapse rate is a fancy term meaning that we know that as we hike a mountain, it gets colder, right? So what does that look like? It looks like this. As air rises, it gets colder. Think about it. You've gone hiking up on top of a mountain, it's nice and cold, you run down the mountain to your car and it's warmer at your car, right? So what we have are values. We have the, uh, oops, the DALR and the SALR. Uh, we can use DLR as well. It's the dry lapse rate and the saturated lapse rate, but uh, I use adiabatic just because it's that way in the book. So what happens is that some temperatures let me back up. You go up a mountain. I'm going to use this arrow. You go up a mountain. As you go up a mountain, it gets colder. Okay? That's why it snows here, but rains down here. When we have rain, it doesn't snow here, but there's snow on all the mountains around us and along the grapevine. That's because they're at a higher elevation, a higher altitude. Now, we have two variables. We know that if the air is dry, which is the D-A-L-R, the temperature change is approximately 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet you go up. So if you go up 2,000 feet, then the temperature difference should be 11 degrees. That's 5.5 times 2. Okay, So that's how that works. Now, at some point, it is possible you hit something called dew point, which is this word right here. Dew point is because of condensation. That is, the temp that is the appropriate temperature at that location in which the gases, the water vapor in the air, is able to condense and turn into a cloud and then perhaps turn into precipitation. Now, that being said, if this is occurring, that means the air is wet. So we use the saturated value, the SALR, which is about 3.3 .3 degrees for every 1,000 feet. So, you know, if you wanted to calculate the difference from down here to up there, you would use your 5.5 .5 for every 1,000 feet until you hit here, where it begins to rain. And then we would use the 3.3 .3 until we hit the top. Well, once you hit the top and that cloud now passes over this mountain range and zips on the way down here because of pressure, it warms up abruptly, so therefore it creates the rain shadow effect. A great example of this, Santa Monica area, you go up the Sepulveda Pass, go into Sherman Oaks, it's very dry, very dry within the valley. And that's because it rained here and not over here. When I think of clouds, and we'll talk about clouds later, I think of sponges. They hold water, right? So you're able to wring out some of the water on the, at the, um, on the windward side ring out some of that moisture, then as your sponge or cloud goes over the range and it sinks back down because of high pressure, also gets warmer, you don't, you don't have any more moisture left in your sponge for it to rain on this opposite side, especially at that temperature. Okay, some people ask, why are these numbers different? Okay, well, thanks for asking that. It's a hard question to answer here. So what we know is that uh, you remember at some point you learned about the uh, stages and change of matter, right? Uh, you have solids, liquids, and gases. In order to go from one and another, you must have a direct change of energy, right? It is either going to be absorbed or released, okay? So if you wanted to, say, take an ice cube and you wanted to melt it, 
the ice cube would need to absorb heat in order for it to turn into a liquid. Okay? So in this case, if you would like a gas, water vapor, to turn into a water droplet, you want it to condense. To go from a gas to a droplet, you must release heat for that process to occur because it's going to get colder, so it's going to release the heat. Well, in that case, by doing so, you're going to be adding additional temperature to the surrounding air parcel, which is why this number decreases. That's the gist of it. Is it okay? Because there is a change of energy, because this gas is turning into, this, the vapor is turning into a liquid, there is heat released. And because that heat release, which happens to be 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit as a measurable value, this number decreases. That's the only reason why. So I hope that makes sense. It's kind of unique. Um, there are additional videos on Canvas that kind of explain that, but it's, just, it's kind of interesting to think that, okay, so in order for that gas to turn into a cloud, there has to be heat exchange. It has to be given away, right? So, um, I don't know. I think it's something that's kind of interesting in that sense. So because that heat is then released, uh, that heat is given out and lessens the number for the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. All right. I know that was a lot. So what do we cover? Uh, we covered really all the fundamental basics of going through uh, the Earth's atmosphere, its composition, and basic structure. Covered a lot of content. Um, again, there are additional videos. There's a great TED Ed video that discusses uh, what is and what is the changes of pressure and how does that work. I highly suggest that. Uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll talk soon.